glad to be here. And I'm um, glad to see so many people from around the country, as well as people in very different roles. Uh, so just let me introduce a little bit about myself. Uh, this is my 22nd year as director of the Children's School at Carnegie Mellon University. And that school is a psychology department laboratory school. We have children in the preschool, ages three and four, and we have children in the kindergarten, age five. And just a little bit of a note about age cutoff, because I know it's different in every state. Um, in our school, in order to be in the threes program, children have to be three by December 31st, which means that some of the children are still two when they're starting the threes program. And similarly, when we get to our what we call our kindergarten, some of the children are still four when they're starting kindergarten, and they will actually be using our kindergarten as a pre-kindergarten. So um, in terms of the ages of your children, you might have a difference in terms of what they are able um, what they are able to do. So you might think of our kindergarten a little bit more as a pre-kindergarten. My second role at Carnegie Mellon is that I'm a teaching professor in the Department of Psychology. So I teach child development classes for undergraduates, and I teach uh, graduate level educational design classes for students who are interested in going into some career with respect to education. Now I noticed from the list of participants that I received that um, we have people ranging from student teachers up to very experienced and even retired teacher, teachers who have been logged into the system. We also have people who are um, directors. We have curriculum coordinators. We have faculty members who are teaching the future teachers. So I'm just wondering if you could go ahead and raise your hand if you are day to day in the classroom with young children. That will help me know what our percentage is. Great, I see those hands being raised. And it's a very large number. OK, wonderful. So it looks like I've lost my hand. Maybe Janice, you can help with that. Um, it looks like a large number of the people on the call are those who are directly in the classroom. But I'll try to also speak to those of you who are um, faculty working with student teachers, because I really feel like the practice guide can be used in your um, teacher education classes. We are already using it in our developmental psychology classes to help, help um, undergraduates understand the process of learning math. So our goal for today is to really help you think about how to engage children in meaningful mathematics. That's why I've titled my slide this way. And that involves independent exploration, as well as some of the direct instruction that um, you'll want to be doing with the children, the projects that you might want to do with them, et cetera. And we're really going to focus on all domains of math. So I know that um, many people focus mostly on counting and uh, other aspects of number and operation. But we're really going to consider all of them. And I tried to represent that here in the pictures that I'm um, showing. So in fact, the little girl in the top left is working on counting. She's using a number board with unifix cubes that have sections for 1 through 10. But you'll notice that she's actually also creating a pattern with those cubes. Uh, the child who worked on that project before her did not make that kind of pattern, though did do all of the counting. We'll also be talking about the geometry aspects of math. You see a student there in the bottom right working with shapes. Uh, we'll talk about measurements. We'll talk about data analysis. You see that in the bottom um, left picture. So we'll be talking about all five aspects of math. So as we think about the practice guide, teaching math to young children, I want to tell you a little bit about how that practice guide was actually created. So the goal is really to help educators capitalize on children's natural interest of math so that their experience can be more engaging and beneficial. So in order to do that, the um, IES, Institute of Education Sciences, creates a panel. And typically, the panels have about six members, um, usually four researchers and two practitioners. So I served on the practice guide as one of the early childhood practitioners 
even though in fact I am also a developmental psychology professor. We also have a support staff working with us. It's about a two-year process where we do a systematic review of the available literature. And I'll explain in a moment sort of how that literature gets chosen. But the basic idea is that it's an iterative collaboration between the panel and the support staff. The panel really taking our expertise and our experience and trying to find the recommendations that we um, view as sort of central to the teaching of mathematics. And the support staff then combing the literature to see whether those recommendations are actually supported by the literature that is um, actually out there. And we used a two-decade period, the last 20 years before um, 2011. And we looked for literature broadly across cultures. So I think at this point, we want to just take a quick poll and see how many of you really are familiar with the practice guide already, or how familiar are you with the practice guide? So if you could take a moment and um, answer that poll. So far, it's a very small number that are very familiar. Two-thirds are not familiar at all, and some are somewhat familiar. So I hope that by the end of today, you will feel that you're very familiar with the basic content of the practice guide so that you can then start thinking about how it applies in your particular context. Thank you. OK, so a key thing to understanding the practice guide is to understand the process of not only making the recommendations, but deciding on the levels of evidence. So your first look at this table probably says to you, oh my goodness, um, there are five recommendations, but there's not any one recommendation that has strong evidence. So let me address that issue before we even get started. So you'll see the recommendations there on the left. Um, I will be reviewing all of them. But what we have to do in order to determine the level of evidence is call the literature. And what's really important to note is that the studies have to focus directly on the recommendation as it is stated. And they can't do anything else or anything less. So we actually started with 2,300 studies. But only 78 of them met the standards of the What Works Clearinghouse in terms of their research quality. And from those, only 28 even fit our specific recommendations. So, and if you uh, download the practice guide, I believe that it's in the little box called Files that you should be able to see on your screen. You can look in the appendix, and especially those of you who are faculty, you might want to look at the studies. Those 28 studies would be excellent studies for your students to read um, so that they can see sort of what's current and what's meeting the standards of research in uh, early childhood mathematics. So the biggest challenge with having the studies actually meet our recommendations is that some of the studies only look at one aspect, or they might have many things that they have changed. And we're only talking about one of those things. So we don't have a way to know if the one thing that we're talking about is the specific cause of the effect. Another thing is that um, IES likes us to have a small number of recommendations basically a handful. So if you look at recommendation two, for example, we had to put four domains of mathematics into one recommendation. There are many, many studies that support this recommendation with respect to geometry, but not with respect to all four geometry patterns, measurement, and data analysis. So that's why the, um, most of the recommendations that are very broad have a minimal level of evidence. The only one that has the moderate level evidence is the narrowest recommendation. Number one, teach, math, teach number and operations using a developmental progression. In terms of the researchers, this basically says to the researchers in the world, we need more evidence for these recommendations. You should be studying these things. But for most of you who are practitioners, you can be assured that the panel is essentially 100% sure that these recommendations are right and you can go ahead and start following them. So we're basically going to spend our time today thinking about 
how you can follow those recommendations. So what I'm going to do for you is summarize the entire practice guide and all five recommendations in six words. The six words are follow developmental progression and live math daily. So follow developmental progression covers the first three recommendations. And I'm going to talk about those three recommendations very briefly in terms of understanding what is a developmental progression, where you can find developmental progression, and how you can then use progress monitoring to know where each child is so you can help challenge them at the next level. I'll even give you some video examples of how to do that. And then we'll spend the rest of the time on living math daily. And that covers recommendations four and five, that we should teach children to view and describe their world mathematically, and that we should dedicate time each day to teaching math and integrate math instruction throughout the day. So I think what we want to do at this point is find out how, what kind of a system you're going to be integrating this um, practice guide into. And the most important thing that we need to know is do you have a specific curriculum that you are following? Or are you able to develop curriculum to fit your specific needs in the classroom? OK, thanks for answering that poll. The numbers are shifting a little bit, but so far, it looks like Almost half do not have a specific curriculum. That gives you a lot of flexibility. And then the other half are divided between, yes, we have a weekly curriculum, and they have somewhat of a curriculum that is established. That's very helpful. Thanks for answering the poll. So let me go on and talk about the first three recommendations, all of which fall under the heading of following developmental progression. Recommendation one talks about that with respect to number and operation, which I'm guessing is the primary emphasis of your curriculum, whether you're designing it yourself or not. It tends to be where the most focus is. And so within the practice guide, each of the recommendations will have sort of sub-steps to them. And these are all available in the guide that you can download from the file um, portion of the website right now. Um, let me just help you see that these are really the logical progression that you would need to take. So basically, we know that children need to, children start out by recognizing small collections, usually one, two, and three. This is called subitizing, numbers that you can recognize without having to count. Then they start moving on to counting those numbers with one-to-one -one correspondence. Once they can do that kind of counting, then they can begin to compare quantities, use those numbers to label their collections. And once they're able to do that, they can progress in, in order to be able to actually solve basic math problems. Now, in a way, this makes total sense. First, children are going to be able to understand one, two, they'll be able to do three. Maybe they can even stretch to four. But until you can count those numbers, until you can see those numbers, very hard to then be able to use them to solve problems. And you can see that when you get to bigger numbers, this is going to be much harder to count until you come up with ways to start organizing it, or unless the world has organized it for you, like the apples here being all in a line. So it's basically a natural progression that children have to use between the things that they can already see and the things that they will have to count, then being able to compare, label, and solve problems. Now, to emphasize that this actually applies also to older children, consider the case of varied representations of the number six. You have the numeral, you have the word, you have your fingers being held up, you have tallies, et cetera. These are ways that you can represent six noticing six on the clock, six sides of a hexagon, six legs on an insect, et cetera. Elementary school students need to quickly recognize these representations and be able to separate them, distinguish them from the representation, representation for something like eight. In order to go farther, once they can count and compare these representations, then they can actually use them to play a game like dominoes, where they need to be able to quickly distinguish between the numbers to work with rulers to solve measurement problems, et cetera. 
So these progressions are very natural. It's not something that's very difficult to know what will need to come next. Still very helpful to see how those progressions lay out across all the domains of math. So in fact, recommendation two adds the other four domains of math. And recommendation three is basically saying, look, we need to understand where children are on the current level, what their current levels are in the progression. And then we can introduce them to skills and concepts that naturally come next. So if you're using a curriculum already, you might have a scope and sequence document. If you're not, you can still get access to lots of sample trajectories. I'm going to referring, be referring today to one from the building blocks curriculum. And that covers all five domains of math, the curriculum that was designed with funding from IES and NSF. And it's one of the ones that was tested in a number of studies that the, um, practice, the practice guide refers to. You could also look in the appendix of the practice guide and see all of the different curricula that were represented in the studies. And IES is not recommending any one of these curricula. Today we're just going to use this one. I happen to use it in one of my classes at school, and it has some very helpful tables. But you can get much more information about these online. So at this point, I'm going to show you how these developmental progressions look. Thanks for making it larger for us, Janet. Um, so each progression is one column in this table. So you can think about the age of the children with whom you work, and that's going to be what you see in that left column. And then you can see this particular table is all the different aspects of the number and operations um, trajectories. So all of these fit under recommendation one. And you can see how the child would need to progress from a counter of small numbers to a counter of and producer of larger numbers all the way down. And if you've got the full trajectory or have one in your curriculum, it would give you descriptions of each of these. I'm going to show you an example in a minute. Um, then if you check the next one, this is the trajectories for the other four domains of mathematics. So the ge geometry trajectories are all the ones that have to do with shapes and spatial sense. That's the first four columns that you're seeing right now. And again, you can look at the um, age level of your children in your classroom and see where they would fit on this. Um, the last three columns are the other three domains of math, measurement, patterning, and, and uh, classifying and analyzing data. And what you would actually use this kind of a representation for, it's almost like a checklist of where the children are. Commonly, children will be at one level across the table, but not always. Children may be more advanced in one trajectory than another. And you can notice that this trajectory actually goes all the way up to age eight, because I'm sure you all know that your children are at multiple levels. And you may have some children that are very advanced, and you have, may have some children who are um, looking more like a younger child in their development. So then the question is, how can you actually assess children's development? And that's where we get to recommendation three, which is called progress monitoring. What we really um, think here is that it's actually a pretty straightforward observation process that you can use often with a natural situation, sometimes with a structured task to reveal a child's level on a learning trajectory. And I'm going to give you an example of moving from level five to level six on that um, trajectory for counting, which is basically, it's not age five, age six. Um, it's a little bit lower. It's actually age three to four. Um, and the particular issue is understanding cardinality, meaning that after you have counted, the last number that you counted is the number of objects in the set. I think Janice is going to get us some videos here that I'm going to show you a ch the same child who uh, in the first video is 31 months, essentially two and a half. And then in the second video is 38 months, just having passed her third birthday. And she's being asked to count um, objects 
to give them to a particular character. So take a listen to these two videos and um, see if you can recognize the difference in these two. Very simple task. You could do it in the context of play and have a very good sense of the child's progression. OK, Emerson. Here's my friend, Curious George. Could you say hi to Curious George? Hi, Curious George. Let him find go for Okay, wait a second. Wait. He, he's going to ask you for a certain number of pine cones, okay? And then you'll put it on the plate and you'll slide it over. Okay, now wait until, until he asks. Okay, see what he says. Okay, he says, he says, Emerson, I would like one pine cone. Could you give Curious George one? Okay, is that one? Yeah. Okay, he says, he says, thank you, Emerson. All right, good job. All right, now, can you give Curious George three pine cones? Is that three? Yeah. Yeah, okay. He says, he says, thank you, Emerson. All right. Can you give Curious George four pine cones? Hmm. How four? How four? Oh, just do your best. How many do you think is four? That's four. Is that four? That one, two, three, four. Is that four? No, that's three, four, five. How many is that? Three. That's right. Can you give him four? Okay. Okay. Okay, I think you can see there um, that she's reached her limit. You know that she is really just supertizing those numbers. Um, she's maybe doing a little bit of counting but isn't sure that the last number actually um, is the amount that she has. And clearly, when she got past three, um, she was frustrated. So here she is, just seven months later. Little oh, these. Those are little pom-poms. I want you to give some of them to the bunny, OK, by putting them on the plate and sliding them over like this. What number? OK, what number? Could you give a bunny four? Is that four? Yes. Okay, thank you. Bunny says thank you. Okay, one more. Could you give Bunny six pom-poms? One, two, three, four, five, six. Is that six? Yes. Okay. Okay, so Janice, can we go back to the slide where we just were? Great. So you just saw a progression from um, what the building blocks trajectory calls level five to level six in the counting progression of cardinality. And um, I think in that second video, you really saw several things that tell you that the child has progressed. One is that her very first question was, what number? Well, she knew that if you're going to give something, you need to know how many. And then she was very deliberate in her counting, and in this case, went up to six, probably could have gone farther. Also notice that while this was a structured task, and it's a task that researchers um, use many times for working with children, you could do the exact same thing in a very natural context to um, see children at snack time counting the number of pretzels or goldfish or pieces of broccoli that they have. Um, you could do it in the classroom when you are counting the number of friends at a table or something like that. So there are lots of ways to get this kind of progress monitoring information without doing any kind of formal testing. You can do it all in very authentic ways. So the next question you might be asking yourself is, 
why is it that we need um, developmental progressions and standards? I'm sure that all of you have state standards, whether or not you're following the common core. The key is that standards just set the expectation for the grade level benchmark. Where are you aiming by the end of the year? What the trajectories do is they emphasize the sequence of development to help you focus for each individual child relative to that benchmark. What am I going to have to do to help that child move to mastery of that grade level benchmark? The other thing is that the trajectories will help you challenge the children who are already above the expected standard for their particular grade level, like the child you just saw in those videos is actually ahead of what would be predicted for her age. Now her mother is a math researcher, so you know that's not that surprising. But whether children are ahead or behind, we need to challenge them at the right level. So essentially, the trajectory progress charts that I showed you a little earlier are showing the standards in the age rows, but the trajectories in the columns. And what you want to do is always be moving the child to the next level, whether or not they've already reached the grade level benchmark. Because you can't just jump in the trajectory. You really need to follow the trajectory um, all the way through from the beginning to the end because the concepts are building on each other. So at this point, um, I've given you a quick overview of the following developmental progression. And what I want to do is move on to the living math daily. But I want to pause at this point and just see if my um, helpers who are watching the questions think um, there are any questions I should answer at this moment. Hi, Sharon. Um, we had a question about the use of the term cardinal. Um, and yes. we're wondering if you could provide some, any insight as to why that particular word has been adopted to re represent this concept. Right. Uh, it's probably old English, and I wish that I had an English degree, but it's, if you think um, the opposite is sort of ordinal. So ordinal numbers are like first, second, third, and cardinal is the end. Uh, we do have a math ed professor on with us. Maybe a math ed professor knows the history of the word. Um, when you're talking with children about it, you can really talk about the last number, the final number, the total, is essentially what you're saying, that the cardinal number is the total of the set that you have or the collection that you have. Um, we don't actually use the word cardinal with our children, but it's what math researchers talk about is the cardinality principle. Um, there are some other principles, like it doesn't matter what order you um, are counting as long as you count everything once. Um, it matters that you keep the order of the words in the number words in the proper order, um, that you um, make sure that you can count actually anything. You can count claps or objects or whatever. But cardinality is really just the total. Great. Thank you. Are there any others that I should handle right now? Uh, I don't believe so. I think, I think you're covering it in the materials. OK, great. Thank you. So I want to spend the rest of our time on living math daily which is my summary for actually recommendation four and five. So let me um, first review those recommendations generally, and then we'll go through it step by step. So in terms of living math daily, recommendation four is basically about children viewing their world, like actually seeing math in the world every day and starting to talk about math in the world. And they start out with thinking about informal methods to represent the math in their world, then linking it with the formal vocabulary, the symbols like the plus sign, the minus sign, et cetera, and the actual procedures for calculation. In terms of the strategies for doing that, um, the guide talks about using open-ended questions to prompt children to apply the mathematics that they know and to, to encourage them to recognize and discuss math. I'm going to actually cover these essentially 
um, in opposite order. I'm going to start with the strategies and move up to the more formal. Um, recommendation five is not really our focus today, but in fact, um, many of the examples I'm going to give you actually fit this recommendation as well. It's basically saying that you actually need every day to teach some math in a somewhat direct instruction kind of way. And then you need to integrate the math throughout the day. So you have the particular lessons of the day, but you want your environment to be full of math for children. You want your routine to incorporate math. You want to have activities or learning centers, however you do it, to actually emphasize math. And you can think about that really across the curriculum. I'm going to give you some social studies and science examples today. Um, you also want to think about um, practice opportunities via games. That should actually say games. Um, it turns out that board games are wonderful opportunities to get the practice that you need to automate these mathematics concepts and skills. And you can do that in a way that's very natural for children. So it's in keeping with the idea of making the mathematics meaningful to them and authentically integrated into their lives. So let's start with the last part of recommendation four, which is the recognizing and describing math. I think about it as notice the math all around you. Now, I saw that we had some teachers of three-year-olds. So um, basically, my point here is that math is everywhere. Here is a um, birthday party for one of our three-year-olds who was turning three in the fall. And when I think about the noticing math, what I encourage people to do is ask themselves the five questions that I have at the bottom of the slide. How many? What shape? What pattern? How big? And how frequent? These are really easy, very informal ways to start talking with children about math. So look at that picture and see all the different ways that we could be thinking about those numbers. Now, since I can't get you to actually tell me, you could put it into the chat um, box. But um, the basic thing is, think how many. Well, gosh, we have one cup, two muffins, three candles, lots more things on the top of that cake. We could be counting in the room things that are behind her, like the jobs and who has that job or no. That's actually a re different items for recycling, different types of recycling elements. When you look at what shape, we obviously have lots of circles in that um, space, lots of things that are round or cylindrical that you could be talking about. When you think about what pattern, you could be thinking about the pattern uh, on the candles which are basically A-B patterns. You look at the clothing that the child and the mom are wearing, also both patterns, one A-B, one looks like A-B-C-B-A, something like that. Um, then you start thinking about size. You could be measuring the candles. You could be measuring the um, cake, the circumference, the height, et cetera. And when you think about how frequent, you can start thinking about things like the um, little decorations on the cake. Are there some more frequent than others? Are there more red, more purple, more green, et cetera? So just looking at a very common picture, you can see all kinds of math opportunities. You wouldn't necessarily take all of those opportunities, but you want children to think about how you are actually, um, how you can actually see the math in the, in the regular world. Now, when we move, um, on from there, we want to make it automatic. And in order to make it automatic, you have to practice it early, often, at school, and at home. The example I have here for you is actually um, my new granddaughter. In that picture, she's about six months old. And um, just walking 100 feet from her house, there are a lot of things that we saw that could be related to math. Clearly, lots of shapes. We could do frequency, we could do size, we could start counting, we could look at numbers, all kinds of ways that we could answer this question. And then thinking um, about yourself, I think the more you do this, noticing the math, the more you will be able to do it with children. Or if you're a faculty member or a director, the more you do it with your students or your staff, the more they will be able to do it with children 
So we all need time to practice that. So take a look around your office. I happen to be right now looking at this um, beautiful batik from um, some friends in Africa. And there are all kinds of mathematical things that I could look at here in terms of how many. Of course, I can count the number of people. Um, I could look at the number of boys, the number of girls, the number of people wearing pants or skirts or different types of clothing, different colors, et cetera. I can look at the circles versus the squares. In terms of the patterns, I could see if there are particular patterns in those people going around the circle. I could be measuring them. I could compare the continents that I'm seeing, et cetera. Here's another thing that I'm looking at right now, uh, a piece of artwork in my office happens to be adult artwork, but it could equally well be in a school. You probably have lots of artwork, lots of rectangles here. We could talk a lot about size. We could talk about the fact that the arrangement of those um, rectangles actually gives us then something that's more like an oval. Um, obviously, the clock, you have numerals. You have the shape of the clock. You could be starting to talk about telling time and counting in that way. Um, so we start looking at what we can see in terms of mathematics. What is it that we want to highlight to our children? Same thing with looking outside. When I look outside my window, I see this uh, beautiful new garden, lots of opportunities for counting in terms of the plants, the trees, the chairs, the tables, um, opportunities for looking at different shapes, regular shapes versus more irregular shapes, um, where you have various symmetries, things like that can start looking if there are patterns in the bricks or not, um, or in the tiles. You could look at um, how frequent the circles, uh, there are circular tables and square tables. What's the frequency of those? We can do the data analysis, et cetera. So in fact, this is the basics of all the math I see um, Charles saying, we're, you know, we're going to be at the bell curve. Absolutely. Um, this is the basics. If you look at these, this is arithmetic. This is geometry. Patterns are the basis of algebra. Um, measurement doesn't necessarily have its own domain. It fits a lot with science. Um, and how frequent is basically the beginning of statistics. So we're going to look at what's available and, in fact, what children find interesting. What you're going to see is today we're going to talk about the things that you might want to pay attention to in terms of the children's interests and how to follow those. So in terms of living math daily, we first have the noticing the math all around you. Then we have the second part of that recommendation is going deeper with open-ended questions. So here's where you'll see more things that are from the children's classrooms. In the practice guide, there are a variety of suggestions. You see that table eight on the right. Um, just the type of questions, asking children, how are these objects the same or different? Getting them to describe. And not everything they describe may be about math. They may talk about texture or color, things like that. But again, you can start counting those things. Um, what can you use to make a pattern? You can take patterns in the picture that I have. We have lots of felt board shapes, all kinds of different shapes. And children could make whatever patterns they want. Then you could look at particular objects and see what patterns there are. You can see that list of open-ended questions. When I think about this, I really try to think about um, looking for situations where there are multiple solutions, not just things that have one right answer, so that then children can um, share the strategies that they have. So as you see the two children at the patterns table, one child made the pattern and then explained the pattern to another child to be able to replicate the pattern. Then each child can um, make their own pattern. In terms of the measuring that you see, um, the, these were sunflowers that we grew in our garden outside. The children right now are measuring with unifix cubes. Um, these particular children did not have any pattern in the colors that they used. Some children think of the strategy of putting the unifix cubes together in 10, so that then it's a lot easier to count. Um, the children uh, in the bottom uh, playground picture, really anything you give children that is groups, in this case groups of animals, they can decide to sort and start counting. That little girl is counting with her bubble wand. Um, one girl's arranging and one girl is counting. So they're seeing 
how each of them represents the world by basically how they organize those animals and then started counting them. So the idea is you want to provide a lot of different manipulatives that will give children sort of the opportunity to start thinking about math, whether it's with some teacher guidance like the counting or whether it is on their own like the pictures on the bottom. So all of these are ways that you can sort of give open-ended material, ask open-ended questions that then will allow children to focus on the math that's interesting to them. Another way that we think about from the practice side, starting with the informal, and uh, thanks for making that bigger for us, um, is that you want to start with the words that children are naturally using for mathematics, and then move to the words that are the actual mathematics terminology. So take a look at that chart for a moment. So the concept of whole numbers, or the concept of equal, we're going to use those terms, but we start with the terms that are more part of common English, like the same number as or the same as. We start with um, more, fewer, greater than, less than, before we talk about unequal. And you can see lots of examples there for the types of activities that you could be doing that would um, have children using these types of descriptors. Um, another example uh, that's a classroom example is for basic sorting. So we just have huge collections of things that children can sort in different ways. Uh, these are just some sort of simple prompts that children get to make two sets. And then what we actually do is have ch uh, children take a photograph of the sets that they make, and then they can talk about it during uh, circle time or in a small group. So for example, here are two pictures that came to the circle time after this activity was presented. And one child basically said, I really liked the flowers. I made a set of flowers. And I have a set of everything else. And so we could start talking about the same and different. In this case, it's shapes. It's not numbers. The child um, represented in the bottom picture actually uh, couldn't restrict um, herself to two sets, ended up making three sets. And you can see on the right, started with shape sets and then switched to a color set. So they can start talking about all the different ways that they could sort these buttons. And depending on the level, depending on where you are in the year, what particular concepts you want to be teaching, you could extend this discussion of the sorting to teach specific counting principles. You could be focusing more on shapes. You could do it as a data analysis activity where you start graphing how many of which types we have, et cetera. So depending where you are, you can extend the activities in lots of ways. And that's one of the values of having open-ended activities. And then the fourth part of this recommendation is integrating the formal vocabulary when you see that children are ready for it. And we really emphasize here that you should do this pretty gradually so that the children are not overwhelmed. They can, um, in a very natural way, incorporate the terminology, the symbols, et cetera, into their um, language so that they build the familiarity and then will automate um, their understanding of the words, the symbols, et cetera. And there you can see some examples. These are all from the number and operation. But you could imagine the same type of chart with concepts from geometry or measurement, et cetera. If you think about measuring, um, for example, starting with the more informal, like the unisex cube that you saw in the other picture recently, but then they could take that and then use and an actual tape measure or something like that, the teacher could introduce them to the ways that they link the unisex type um, measurement with something that is a more formal measurement, like uh, tape measure. Um, here are a couple of other examples of beginning to move to the formal, um, where the child is actually not using the objects themselves to make the graph, but actually transferring what she is um, graphing 
onto the paper using a more abstract symbol. In this case, she's using an X, and she has the count going up the side and the colors on the bottom. Here's another example of a child who's already at the point of starting to think about the number system and recognize that the numbers, if you draw them in a 10 by 10 grid, will actually have a pattern to them. And she's following the pattern so that she can fill in the numbers in this grid. Again, you wouldn't show this kind of formal representation until the child is already very familiar with the numbers 1 to 100. And like this would have been at the end of our pre-kindergarten year where they are working with hundreds. So gradually, as children are ready, you are going to think about how you use those representations, when to introduce them based on the children's readiness. So let me pause for a moment and just see how much you think you're using those representations and maybe you can add that or using these recommendations already. Um, I'm guessing that a lot of the um, a lot of the things that you're doing in your mathematics classroom already fit the recommendations that we're talking about so far, that you're already doing a lot of these types of activities, that you're already following these types of progressions. If people have ideas, go ahead and start putting them into the chat box. So that, and then I'm going to move on to giving you some ideas about sort of taking things further, particularly in the area of a very open-ended kind of uh, celebrations and collections. OK, so we have um, people who are doing a lot with setting the table, lunch, snack, those kinds of things. Um, uh, and um, Doug is talking about, um, in terms of math content students, this would be pre-service um, teachers, I'm guessing, getting them to actually start working with this math because they need to be able to do it as well as the students need to be able to do it, and particularly those who aren't as comfortable with math. Okay, great. We have a lot of blocks. We, in fact, did an entire unit on building, on building, during which the children did an inventory of every block that we had in the classroom, all the different types of blocks, how many of each shape, all of those kinds of things. Uh, a lot of how many friends are there. Uh, probably at the beginning of every year, you do a lot of things where the children are getting to know each other. So you can do lots of things with the number of friends. You can graph all kinds of features of the friends, their birthdays, um, their hair color, et cetera. You can do all kinds of pattern games with friends. Uh, lots of things about taking votes. Excellent. And yes, we're seeing lots of um, pre-service teachers are not comfortable with math. That's why I think this practice guide would actually be really helpful to them, because it breaks things down in a pretty straightforward way. Okay. Uh, and I see a lot of people saying there are issues about intentionality. So I think that's one of the real benefits here, is trying to help yourself be more intentional. And there are a variety of NACI resources about being more intentional in, uh, in general about teaching, I believe. One book is actually called The Intentional Teacher. They have another book uh, about early math that talks about the five domains and how to be more intentional about each domain of math within the program that you have. And definitely, um, when we get together in June for the face-to-face, -face, we'll be going into each domain of math with respect to each of the um, recommendations and giving you a lot of examples. Today, we really don't have time for that. So I wanted to highlight some of the things that you may be doing and maybe not capitalizing on as much as you could. Now, I had a birthday picture earlier. And children, of course, love birthdays, but they love all kinds of celebrations. So consider highlighting math as they celebrate. And our favorite is 100 Day. It, maybe you could raise your hand if you do some kind of 100 Day celebration. I see lots of hands going up. So in the chat box, I'm going to encourage you to um, put your best 100-day idea. I'm going to share just a few that um, we had 100-day back in February. <coughs> Excuse me. All of our classes, 
use some kind of representation of the days. So here you can see a picture of circle time, and uh, this happened to only be the third day of school. The child is putting the number three in the third space. Notice that also this class made their um, little tickets for each number also have a pattern. So the odd numbers are one color, and the even numbers are another color. This is our pre-kindergarten kindergarten classroom, and they um, are using the 100 grid. You can also see an example of data analysis. Every day they have a question that has two answer options, the beginning of the year always yes and no. And the children, when they come into the classroom, have to write their name on a little ticket and then um, vote whatever it is or give their answer to the question. And then someone during circle time will um, talk about what we learned from that vote. So that's part of our routine for data analysis. But it's basically also how we build the excitement for 100 days. Um, here's an example of children making a 100 chain. This actually is only a fours classroom. They did not choose to do it in a way that had patterns or emphasized the tens. You could certainly go farther with it. That's how the children decided to do it. Um, here's another fours classroom. We have a woodworking center. And so together, they worked on getting 100 packs into this board, um, figuring out ways to keep track of how many they had so that they knew they had 100 by the end. Um, here's a fun program um, where you can take your image and um, see what you'll look like when you're 100 years old. Um, you probably know that age is really difficult for children to think about. If you ask them how old uh, they think you are, they might say something like 13, because that seems like a really big number. Or they might say 100, because they don't know that numbers, you know, how numbers work with age. But that's a lot of fun for them. Um, here's an example of emphasizing the 10 10. Um, in this case, it's with snack, building your own snack with 10 of each of 10 different things. Uh, here's a similar activity with crowns. Um, actually, you can see one little girl building the chain, but another little boy there is um, wearing his crown. Each strip of the crown had 10 um, items on it, 10 stickers. And then here's another example of making 100 out of 10 sets of 10 dots. So we have lots of ideas. There are all kinds of ones coming up on the chat that you can also see. Um, lots of um, ways to do this. Lots of actually 100 charts. Um, yeah, somebody else used the same app. Great. Um, oh, also then connecting it with literacy, asking the child what they think they will look like when they're 100. Um, lots of chains, adding a chain each day. So you already have a lot of ideas for how to do this. You can also think about other celebrations. Um, at our school, we're really downplaying a lot of the traditional holidays because we have a very diverse population. And so there are ways you could do a fall celebration, winter celebration, spring celebration, and just incorporate a lot of math into that celebration. I think your biggest possibility, though, is with collections. And I know that all of you will have a variety of social studies goals that you're meeting. Um, for many of our social studies goals, we are emphasizing community. And so we um, emphasize ways that the children can connect with their community. Our particular campus has an enormous food drive in November. And so our school always participates in the food drive. And here you'll see um, children. We were trying to get enough cans to stretch all the way around our bicycle track. And what I want to emphasize here is how this ties back to the developmental progression. So all of the children from three all the way up to five were participating in this food drive. They all brought cans. They all helped with it. The younger children, maybe we emphasized with them just sorting by shape. You have things that come in, um, in cans that are the cylinder versus boxes. Or we might have them help with small amounts of counting. But by the time they're at the five, they're rising to the challenge of things like, wait a minute, how can we make these stretch around? We didn't have enough to get all the way around the bike path. But then they figured out that if you turned them on their sides, they would be longer, and they would be able to reach farther around the path. So depending on the age, you're going to challenge them at the next level. You know where they are, and then use that collection to challenge them. Are we going to 
count them and then graph what do we collect more of, more vegetables, more fruits, more cereal, et cetera. You can go lots of ways with it. We also happen to live in Pittsburgh, where Fred Rogers is um, one of our heroes. And so every year we do a sweater drive in honor of Fred Rogers on his birthday. And uh, in this photograph, it's the kindergarten class that was charged with sorting the sweaters, getting them ready to um, send to the place where we're donating them. And here you can see a great example of different strategies. So we asked the children to sort by size. And one of the children is using um, a, a very physical strategy to sort by size by aligning the sleeves and seeing how long the sleeves are. Another child who happened to be a reader is using the strategy of look at the label and see what the number is, and then put them in categories by the number in the label. I find that science um, collections are actually um, even more popular with our children. And uh, we do units every year from physical science, from um, natural science, et cetera. Uh, since we're talking with our friends in Arkansas, I picked here Arkansas Court. Um, our children in the kindergarten also just um, did a unit on geology, so I'll show you that in a moment. Um, you can also use um, artifacts. In this case, um, this is buttons, and they're arranged in a particular way. You could imagine, again, counting them. What kind of patterns can we make? What kind of shapes can we have, et cetera? I'm going to run with the more natural um, science kind of example just because my kindergarten did just do this geology unit. They spent a lot of time um, making rock collections from rocks that they could find around our region. Um, you can see from their rock exploration center that they had opportunities for sorting the rock, rocks, for um, weighing the rocks, so that would fit into measurements. Um, they also, we happen to live, uh, have our school right down the street from the Natural History Museum, so we were able to borrow a set of rocks, and each child chose a rock for exploration and became uh, the rock um, explorer. They were the geologists. You might not be able to read all of those elements, depending on how big your screen is. Um, thanks for uh, enlarging that for us, Janet. So um, there is a place for them to write what shape it is, whether they decided it was small, medium, and or large. And then if you looked over the whole class, you would see that there wasn't agreement about that. Um, so some people chose large for a rock that was smaller than a rock that someone else said medium. That gets to a lot of interesting discussion. You see they had to weigh the rock. We actually had a very precise scale from one of the science labs. They did the length and the circumference with string, and you can see those strings right there. And then they did um, a scratch test and a marking test. In other words, can you scratch the rock? Or can the rock, rock make a mark on something else? And then they had to do descriptions of the rocks. Is it smooth or rough, flat or round, et cetera? Once they had all the data, then they could start comparing across the rock. So with collections, you can do all kinds of things with every aspect of math. And I can tell you it was highly motivating for the children. So I'm wondering what kinds of collections you actually have done. So you may want to. Um, put some of those ideas into the um, chat box. I know one comment I get a lot is, you know, it's hard uh, to, for some of our schools to buy a lot of the prepackaged and manipulatives. And really, very few of the things I've shown you today are things that we actually bought in terms of manipulatives. Yes, there are unifix cubes, and there are some things that are really helpful to have. But you could do almost all of the math you would ever want to do. Um, or ever need to do and have a really rich math program with all materials that are just found items, loose parts, things like that. Um, so rocks is one obvious example. We also have an extremely large collection of caps, like plastic caps from things that are um, good in terms of these kinds of sorting activities. You all go through lots and lots of markers, save those caps. There are all kinds of caps that you can save. So you'll get some. Uh, yeah, I see twigs from the playground, bottle caps, if someone else does bottle caps. Oh, hotel key cards, that's a really interesting idea. Um, yes, uh, lots of flea markets. We also have a place in our city called the Center for Creative Reuse, and they have basically gotten 
things that industry is disposing of but that are clean and that can be used in lots of creative ways by teachers. So there are all kinds of ways that you can work with collections. So I only have a few more minutes, and what I want to do is then bring this collection idea back to the four parts of recommendation number four, which is really getting children to recognize, to notice, and to then describe their world in mathematical ways. So I broke that down into noticing, going deeper with open-ended questions, starting with the informal, and then moving to the more formal vocabulary. In this particular example, I'm going with leaves. No matter where in the country you live, you can go very quickly outside and find lots of different plants that you could be using as a collection. We happened to do a unit on trees this fall, and so that was very interesting for our children. Again, you can look at how many, not just how many leaves you collect, but look at the clusters. How many leaves are in each cluster, and what different kinds of trees have different kinds of clustering patterns? Obviously, you can look at the shapes, and the challenge here is that the shapes aren't just the regular circle, square, and triangle. So how are we going to describe those shapes? What kind of patterns can we make with the types of leaves that we find? How can we measure these leaves? You know, you can't just use a standard measuring because they have different dimensions. And in fact, when you want to describe them, are you counting the points, not counting the points? How are we thinking about that in terms of measuring? And then you could do all kinds of graphing. You can graph within the type of leaves. You could graph your whole collection, what you have, uh, the, the most leaves, which kinds of plants have the highest frequency of leaves, those kinds of things. You have lots of options. And in terms of those open-ended questions, you can go back to the list and say, well, how can we measure this? What are our different options? How can we describe these shapes and have children share their different strategies? Start with the words that they have already learned, and then start increasing their vocabulary by introducing the words like addition, subtraction, introducing the formal names of the shape, getting from two-dimensional and three-dimensional, introducing inches and centimeters, introducing the different units of weight, things like that. So depending on what it is that interests the children and the direction that you go, add the formal vocabulary as appropriate. Similarly, you can think about all the different aspects of math within the same collection. You don't really need different collections for the different aspects of math. So here I've given examples where you would start. So you'd start by just the basic sorting, but then get to larger collections with more types of options as you go to fours or into fives. Again, with geometry, you can start with identifying the shape, drawing attention to the also science properties. What's different about the leaves? and the coniferous plants versus the deciduous types, et cetera. Start thinking about patterns, and then not just the typical A-B pattern, but keep challenging the children to move up the progression to the different types of patterns, not just repeated patterns, but also growing patterns, like one, two, three, four, et cetera. And then when we move into measurement, you can start with basically just ordering, your seriating, which are biggest, smallest, et cetera. Again, remembering you might not have agreement about what you're looking at in terms of the measurement. Are you looking at the cluster number, the points? Are you looking at length or width, um, et cetera? And then as you get to older children, start using more measurement tools and doing more recording of the data. And then finally, with data analysis, you're going to start with sorting in lots of different ways. Um, older children will do more in terms of recording and get closer and closer to more formal type graphs. You might start with just actually tasting the leaves onto a graph, so the leaves themselves are creating the graph, and then move to a more formal graph where you're counting and then using one square to represent or use a pie graph, something like that. So we have lots of different ways to live math daily, and I think collections are just highly appealing to children, very motivating for them. They keep growing, and so as the year progresses or as your unit progresses, if that's how you operate, then you'll be able to go deeper and deeper with the mathematics that you're seeing. So at this point, we want to take a poll because we're near our end. Um, how is it that, um, how consistent is this type of approach using these recommendations 
with the um, approach that you're already using. So I see already people are registering. Great, very consistent. That's wonderful to hear. And almost no one, see that part of, fortunately no one saying at this point that it's not at all consistent. And here again, I think we get back to that issue of seeing how it is that we want to be more intentional about the math so that, in fact, we do it more frequently and we do it um, more in line with where children are on the developmental progression. My friend, who is a math education researcher, has a study where she looks at, um, she asks teachers how much math they do during the day. And teachers typically significantly overestimate the amount of math that they're doing. We think we're doing it. And when we actually look at it, when researchers actually come in and look at it, it turns out that the amount of math that's happening in uh, especially preschool and pre-kindergarten classrooms, it's actually quite low in most places. So if we're more intentional and we integrate it more throughout our day in ways that are meaningful for children, then it's going to be 